This program is brought to you by the Vegetarian Society of Hawaii, a nonprofit organization dedicated to sharing with the community the many benefits of a vegetarian diet. Free monthly meetings include vegetarian experts found locally and on the mainland, quick and easy cooking demonstrations, and helpful and delicious food samples. Members enjoy an informative quarterly newsletter, social activities, and discounts at many vegetarian-friendly restaurants and health food stores. For an application, call 944-8344. That's 944-8344. Or visit our website at www.vsh.org. vsh.org. Aloha, and welcome to the monthly public lecture of the Vegetarian Society of Hawaii. It's wonderful to see all of you here tonight. The Vegetarian Society of Hawaii, since 1990, has continued to follow our mission of promoting human health, animal rights, and protection of the environment by means of vegetarian education, as we've grown to become one of the largest nonprofit vegetarian societies. In We'd like to encourage those of you who are not yet members, and even those of you who are not yet vegetarians, to join the Vegetarian Society tonight. Our members receive an informative newsletter, as well as discounts at Down to Earth and many vegetarian-friendly restaurants. Just think, if you spend only $8 a week on groceries or on eating out, a Vegetarian Society of Hawaii membership will more than pay for itself. Please be sure to stay after our program and sample some delicious raw vegan dishes prepared by Chef Doug McNish with ingredients provided by the generosity of down-to-earth natural foods. Tonight's presentation is being videotaped for a broadcast on the VSH TV series, Vegetarian. On Oahu, you can watch it on Alelo Channel 52 every Wednesday at 11 a.m. and on the first and third Thursdays of each month at 6 p.m. You can also go to our website, vsh.org, to see videos of this and many of our previous presentations. You'll also find lots of other great information there, including recipes, our famous dining guide, past newsletters, and even a link to our own Facebook page. You may recall that last month we introduced to you Mary Molly Matsumoto, our most recent Maybell Roth Vegetarian Scholarship winner. Mabel Roth was a VSH member who endowed a scholarship at the University of Hawaii with a $150,000 legacy. Ms. Roth created the scholarship in partnership with the Vegetarian Society of Hawaii. This month, we'd like to introduce to you Melly Fernandez, who won the Mabel Roth Scholarship for three years in a row receiving an award of $10,000 each time for the academic year spanning 2004 to 2007. We're pleased to announce that Melly Fernandez has just passed her national exam to become a registered dietitian and will be graduating this summer with a master's degree in nutritional sciences. Please welcome Melly Fernandez. First of all, I would like to say how honored I am to be the first recipient of the Mabel Roth Vegetarian Scholarship. I've been a vegetarian for 30 years. I grew up here in Hawaii. I've actually traveled a little bit too, and I, I lived in Brazil for about 10 years. It was there where I started to become interested in nutrition as a science, particularly vegetarian nutrition and its therapeutic benefits. We become vegetarians or we eat a vegetarian diet for different reasons. Some people here have chosen a vegetarian diet. Some people do it because it's for, for health reasons, others for the ecological sustainability of our planet, and also for, to support animal rights. But for whatever reason we choose a vegetarian diet, we need to meet our nutrients. We have nutrient needs with our, the food we choose. So in order to optimally choose our food, we need up-to-date information. And that's where research comes in. And for that reason, I decided to dedicate my uh, graduate studies to focus on vegetarian nutrition. And so now I would just like to share with you a little bit about the research that I've been able to do with the support of the Roth Vegetarian Scholarship. And the objective of this study was to actually improve the food offerings for students who live on campus. I worked together with the Sodexo Food Service and obtained the recipes for all of their vegetarian meal offerings for their four-week menu cycle and did computer nutrient analysis. We found that students need education. 
that they need to be uh, need information in order to navigate in the cafeteria to, f- to figure out which foods to choose in order to make a complete meal, to make a balanced meal. So we shared this information with Sodexo, and in response, what they did was they actually hired a vegetarian chef. The university now has created a place called the Sustainability Courtyard, where they have two kiosks which serve exclusively vegetarian food. So we're talking about things like tofu and tempeh, and also things like Veggie, veggie hot dogs and veggie burgers, things like that, those very convenience foods. We approached the American Dietetics Association for additional funding so that we could do chemical nutrient analysis, do laboratory analysis, some of these products to find out, you know, to really represent what's in the actual food. A vegetarian meat alternative food composition database. It will be a web-based resource which will be available to consumers We went into the major markets uh, and health food stores in Honolulu, and we found out that there are 245 different products. From that survey, we selected a representative sample of 40 products, and we did the laboratory nutrient analysis on those products, and we compared that results to the food labels. Now, the findings from this study will be presented in San Diego later this year in a food and nutrition conference and they will also be written up for the American Dietetics Association Nutrition Journal. In conclusion, I would just like to say that I feel very blessed to have received this, the Roth Vegetarian Scholarship. I have learned a lot about research uh, in an area that I'm passionate about, and I hope to continue to be a resource for the vegetarian community here in Hawaii and, and beyond. So thank you very much. Thank you, Millie. I think that Maybell Roth would be proud of what you've accomplished. It's now time for our special guest. We're delighted to have with us tonight, Chef Douglas McNish. (laughs) (laughs) Chef McNish made important decisions and brought organic vegan cuisine to a whole new level. Specializing in both cooked and raw foods, He won the Iron Chef title twice in vegan cooking competitions. He has cooked on TV and for celebrities and also teaches classes regularly. He is currently the executive chef of a raw food restaurant in Toronto. His presentation is entitled, A Professional Chef's Journey to Raw Success. Please welcome Chef Douglas McNish. First and foremost, before I get started with my story about food or anything, I really want to say thank you to everyone here at the Vegetarian Society of Hawaii. I really want to say thank you to Ori Ann Lee. <clears throat> she saw me a couple of years ago. I did a vegan Iron Chef competition in Toronto. Got on the mic and I told my story. I was bouncing around and having fun. It was a great night. Two years later, she gave me a call. I was busy at the restaurant, just finished lunch service, and I got a call and it said, Hi, my name is Ori. I saw you at a competition. I'd like to fly you to Hawaii. And I said, no, this is a joke. You have to be at, there's no way. She said, no, it's not a joke. I was really impressed by your story and what you did. And we would like to fly you to Maui and Honolulu to talk about, you know, what you do for a living. And uh, right away I said, yes, I didn't have, didn't have to think twice. I've been here since Tuesday. The jet lag is starting to get better. It's almost one in the morning, my time. Um, I've been nonstop meeting a lot of people, doing talking, and you know, one of the things that's kept me going here are, are the people. Ever since I got off the airplane on Tuesday, I was, everyone has smiled at me. Everyone has said, hi, how are you doing? It's paradise. It, it really is. I'm coming from five months of winter right now. It's been in, in Fahrenheit. We do, we do Celsius. In Fahrenheit, it's been about 20 for the last five months and blowing snow and wind and ice and everyone's depressed. So for me to come here to see palm trees and beautiful women and pineapples and and orchids around my neck, it, it truly has been heaven for the last five days. So again, thank you to the Vegetarian Society. Thank you so much to everyone here, and you really are so lucky to be living in such a beautiful place. Hopefully one day I can make enough money, sell enough books to be able to come back and open a restaurant. 
So again, my name is Douglas McNish. I know I seem really young. I am. I'm 28 years old. I began cooking at the age of 15 years old. It was just the first job I took. It was in a British pub. I was cooking steak and kidney pies and French fries and, and learning curry and how to cook rice and mashed potatoes. And I fell in love with it. I fell in love with every aspect of a professional kitchen. You're running around. Everyone's always joking. It's not like an office job in that you go in and you get to create every day. At a young age, I found what I wanted to do. I knew I wanted to be this famous chef one day. I said, that's it. So I kept cooking, did my thing, learning, learning, learning. When I was 18, I went to chef school. I learned the traditional way of cooking, you know, meat and dairy and veal and foie gras and deep frying and poaching and all the ways that you're taught. Like, this is how you make money. This is what you do. This is what chefs do and what cooks do. Never any thought or mention at all about nutrition, about ethics, about the environment, absolutely nothing at all. All they do is teach you how, how to bread a piece of a chicken, throw it in a deep fryer, and that's how you make your salary. So the years went by, and I cooked for some great places. I worked at the Air Canada Centre, which is, uh, I used to cook for the Toronto Maple Leafs, which is the NHL team, and the Toronto Raptors, which is the NBA team. I worked for the best catering company in Canada, did some amazing events, weddings that were $2 million, uh, closed down whole city blocks. I've worked for huge corporations. I've served coffee in the hippie part of Toronto and muffins. I've kind of done everything at this point. By the age of 21, what happened to me was I was a very depressed young man, talented in the kitchen, but very depressed. I, I had reached about 270 pounds. I'm only five foot seven, so you can imagine what that looked like on my frame. My skin was terrible. It drove me crazy every day. I had terrible acne, and I had picked up bad habits because, you know, lo and behold, a lot of chefs, they work hard and they play hard. So I was going out every night and drinking beer and smoking cigarettes and getting up into trouble. There was something brewing in me for, for years. I would say two or three years, I really wanted to change my life, and I had no idea what it was. I had no girlfriends, I had never been kissed. There was just so many things. I, I didn't want to get up in, in the morning and, and go to work or go to school. It was a Saturday night. I was working at a great restaurant in downtown Toronto. I had just been promoted. Within three months of working there, they gave me a pay raise and a lot more responsibility. They told me to stay on and they would make me management down the road and I would have a great salary and a company car. And it felt great. What happened is it was a Saturday night. Uh, we all finished a really busy dinner service. We used to do 400 covers, 500 covers, four hours, you're just under intense heat and pressure. And the first thing you do when you're done a shift is you want to go out and drink beer. So we started. We started our night off, and I went out, did my partying. The, the next morning I woke up, <clears throat> I had blood on me, vomit, did not know how I got home. And that was pretty much it. I woke up that day, and I said, I'm going to change my life. And I went out to the living room. I was still living at home at the time. And I told my parents, uh, listen, I've been doing this over the years. I've been dealing drugs since I was 14. Today's the day I'm going to change my life. They wanted to send me to rehab. I said, you know what? Let me do this on my own. Let me see, let me see what I can do. Let me see what happens. And the next three months, I sat in my room, started to detox my body out started to feel a lot better. I, I went through a lot of, I was trembling and shaking and I couldn't sleep, but it was so necessary to get those toxins out of my body. I did not want cancer or diabetes or to die at the age of 35. You know, I started working out, going to the gym. Everyone thinks, okay, I got to sweat a little bit, get on a treadmill. Started losing a little bit of weight. The one thing I didn't change was my diet. I was still eating a whole pizza every night, bags of popcorn, chicken fingers, sugary. I was drinking pop or soda here in the United States. And inadvertently, I had made a friend in New York. I went down to meet her one time, and she was a vegan. And at that time, I had no idea what the word meant. It scared the hell out of me. She had, over email and conversation, she had mentioned that animals have feelings and that, you know, a veget I think we all hear that a vegetarian diet, it's all in, in the back of people's minds. But for one reason or another, they always want to put it to the back burner. You know, I, I knew there was videos floating around on the internet of animals being tortured, but again, I was a chef. I, I was born and bred to cook meat. This is what I did to make a living. You know, to take a huge, huge hit and say what I'm doing is wrong was, was, was hard for me. So I'd been talking to her. I would go down and eat steak and come back to Toronto. And I went down to visit her one time, and we went to a fine dining restaurant. It was number one in the world at the time. This is seven years ago. We each had a 14-course tasting meal. It was like $500.00. She had the vegan, and I had everything, foie gras, cream, fish, every animal, every barnyard animal, their, their secretions, I was on my plate. We went back to her apartment, 
she said, you know, I want to show you this video. And I said, uh, okay, you know, I was always putting it off knowing what I was going to see. I didn't know what I was going to see. And for the next half an hour, I watched absolute torture. I watched, and no exaggeration here, I watched uh, cows being poked in the face with pitchforks, grown men taking baseball bats and beating baby pigs in the face, stomping on chickens while they were alive, spitting on, just spitting on them, total disrespect for life. I couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe what I saw. Again, for me, you get a box of chicken breasts and you season them and you throw them on the grill. It's just, to me, it's not anything. And I said, well, wait a sec. They breathe, they love, they enjoy life. I was working at the Air Canada Centre at that time. I was working the grill in a steakhouse. So my job was to cook two to 300 steaks a night to order. So I decided actually to go vegetarian that night. Kept a little bit of fish in my diet, so I wasn't technically vegetarian. Because, you know, I wanted to do the research. I said, I'm going to go on the internet, I'm going to buy all the books, I'm going to figure out what my body actually needs to be healthy. So I had a little bit of fish, a little bit of shrimp, I was still eating tuna, and uh, mayonnaise made with eggs. So I had announced, I came back to the Air Canada Centre, and I had announced to them that I'm vegetarian. And they all thought I was crazy. I had sous chefs, chefs. I even had one NBA player, who I won't name, come up to me and he told me my hair was going to fall out. I, I kid you not. They said that I was going to die, anemia, that I would be sick, that I would be lacking in vitamins and minerals. And uh, yeah, over the next five, six months, I ate my lentils, I ate my chickpeas, I ate my steamed kale, steamed broccoli, and they would all sit around and eat factory farmed chicken with white pasta, and they called me crazy. Well, the weight started to come off. I was still exercising, eating, switching from the worst diet possible to eating lentils and kale. Again, eating a little bit of fish just to make sure, you know, I was getting everything. The end of the season came. Uh, our teams didn't make the playoffs, so I got cut out early. I went back to my catering company, and I decided to go vegan. I said, well, you know, I've come this far. What the hell? Why not try this out? And I felt amazing. Uh, instantly, when I cut the dairy and the fish out of my diet, my skin cleared up. I had suffered with acne and been to countless doctors. They had given me prescription after prescription after prescription. It came to the point where one doctor said, okay, I'm going to give you this prescription. This is going to work, but it's going to want to make you commit suicide. <laughs> and I looked at him, and I couldn't believe he was telling me this. And I, I thought there must be another way. So I started reading and learning about nutrition. I cut the dairy out of my diet. Within about a month, my skin started to clear up couldn't believe it. Again, you know, 15 years I'd been suffering. I had terrible migraines. I was diagnosed with a migraine condition when I was about two years old, and I had them my whole life to the point where if I got one, it would knock me out for four days. Again, within about two, three months after getting rid of the dairy and uh, everything out of my diet, my migraines went away. Still haven't had one to this day. Life just improved. Over the course of the next six to ten months, I lost, in total, I lost about 100 pounds started working with a personal trainer. I said, well, I've come this far. I want to start putting muscle on. So I went from being probably the most acidic, unhealthy human being to becoming buff. <laughs> I started getting muscles and I started getting, I started feeling amazing. I, um, I was sleeping less. I had more energy. My hair was softer. I literally felt, I felt like I was pushing a religion on people. And I started telling, oh my God, you know, if you do this, this will happen. You, and they were all telling me to shut up. Like, Listen, <laughs> We're going to do what we do. It's great that you're doing that. Just don't get on your pedestal and, you know, be preaching. Which, here I am today. <laughs> so, the, yeah, so the next six months I was working in a meat company. I was making a lot of money. I was working for a celebrity chef downtown Toronto. He, Hungarian guy, again, he told me I was going to die and be sick. I was responsible for the meat station because I had been there for a few years. So I had tattooed the word vegan on my arm and then started putting vegetables, fruits and vegetables on my arm. <laughs> Well, I was passionate. I had changed my whole life. I had gone from being this very depressed young man to being in shape and good looking and I felt good and I was, I was protesting, holding signs outside of stores saying, don't wear fur, don't eat meat. And it was great, you know? I was starting to get attention from the girls and that helped and just my whole, my, I don't want to say ego, but I just felt great. Again, I was making a ton of money, but I was the most hypocritical human being on the face of the planet because I was cooking, I was responsible for doing, I would do 600 liters of veal jus. And we would get, to give the, the sauce body, we would roast the bones and simmer the bones in water, but we would get pig's legs that would come in this big, cut off at the knee, still bloody from the slaughterhouse, and I would just put those into the pan because that gives the jelly, the gelatin from the pig's leg, helps give the sauce body. So there's actually pictures of me with my tattoos holding this bloody pig's leg. It, it was difficult for me. 
But again, I was 20, how old was I at that time? 22, 23. I was making $55,000 a year. I had no rent to pay. I was just going and gallivanting around. But I couldn't do it anymore. And I found a job downtown Toronto. It was a vegan cafe. I went down to $19,000 a year. I went broke working there. I started to go into debt, but I felt amazing. I, I was into this world where everyone was vegan and everyone was cooking beans and tempeh and greens and everyone was happy. And I didn't have to hide the fact that I was doing protests because I was protesting with the people I was working with. It, it felt amazing. I felt like I was at home. Yeah, my paychecks went from $2,000 to about you know $600, but I didn't care. So I kind of had to relearn everything. I spent a lot of time in New York. I was spending all my money going to restaurants. I would go for four days and I would go eat at 10 different restaurants. One, you know, any given day I would go to six restaurants and just get one thing and just see what they were doing. I, if I didn't know what quinoa was or if I didn't know what tempeh was, I would go to the restaurant, eat it, go home, Google, research, bring that back to Toronto and on my off time just play around with these recipes. And I started to play around and I said, well, you know, I can do this. I was scared. I didn't know if I could make a living. I was definitely taking a risk. There was several times where I'm like, I'm going to save the world. I'm going to go work for Greenpeace. I'm going to stop cooking. But I didn't. I stuck through it. Did that vegan cafe for a year-ish. Met lots of the vegans in Toronto. They loved my tattoos. Started making a name for myself. There was a vegan restaurant that wasn't that great. It was uh, partially raw, partially cooked food. They needed a head chef. So I got a call. The owner poached me away. She gave me a little bit more money, not, not a ton. You know, I went from like 19 to like 25,000 a year. But I got carte blanche because it wasn't that great. So I was able just to play around with stuff and create. And I really got into raw food at that point. It had been, I guess, three or four years at that point I had been vegan. And, you know, from my experience and talking to people and, and doing these talks and just friends and even in my own life, the, the longer you stay on a vegetarian diet, the more you gravitate towards whole foods. At first, you're definitely trying to replace things that you once that you once ate. So you go to the tofu and the fake meats and the fake cheeses, and you're like, "Oh, well, I can still have a ham sandwich. It's it's just made from you know processed soy and sugar and night night. There's still nitrates in it." Yeah. So I came to this raw food restaurant. Truth be told, I had lost all the weight. I felt amazing. So I was going out and gallivanting around the city and going on dates and not caring about what I ate. I thought, "Well, I'm vegan. It doesn't matter what I eat. I'm not going to put on weight." Within about a year, I put 40 pounds back on. So down 100, back up to 40. I was like, oh, Jesus, what did I do? I did all this work, and I went, worked so hard, and now I'm a little bit chubbier again. I wasn't fat, a little chubby. So I started eating more raw food and started running. And the combination of running and raw food, not all raw, about half, you know, half to three quarters, the 40 pounds was gone maybe in two months. And I started really weight training. The more I started eating whole foods, my muscles just started growing. And I started doing research and I started learning about what unprocessed whole foods can do for your body. I did that. I worked at that restaurant for about a year and a half. Kind of grew as a chef. A lot of chefs, we, we move on. We always need to keep doing our own thing until we own our own restaurant or business. There was a raw restaurant that opened just outside of Toronto, about 20 minutes in the suburbs. The person who was the chef who opened it, she bailed on the owners and connected with them. And I'm not going to lie, I was a little bit scared. Um, I liked the raw food, but I had never done it on a professional level. And I came in, and again, it was a blank slate. I got to write the entire menu within about a month. Appetizers, mains, desserts, salads, everything. And uh, I just got to create. It's a cute little quaint place, about 18 seats. Very small, very intimate. I'm behind the counter. The people come in, and I talk to them. I started to go more and more raw. The health benefits, just right away, you, you feel them. It's absolutely amazing. One of the best ways to explain raw food, raw food can encompass anything. It can mean, you, if, you're, if you're a fairly healthy person, it can mean in the morning eating you know, a couple of apples and a banana, and then your next meal is maybe a kale salad, which you guys are going to try later on. And then it could be a smoothie. And it's just, basically, you keep your body going the whole day. You keep your metabolism at a certain level. Your blood sugar levels are always even. When you, you start to balance your blood sugar levels up and down, that's when you start craving sugar and fried foods and you feel grumpy and you're not nice and people hate being around you. The cool thing about raw food is your blood sugar level is always at this level if you're doing it properly. You always have to eat. Again, a simple way to put it is the more processed a food is, the more processed your body, the more processing your body has to do to break it down. Your body requires energy to break down food. Okay, so that's why, I mean, not me anymore, obviously, but my family will go out to a buffet to eat, and 
after the buffet, they're all like, oh my God, I can't, I'm so tired, I can't move. And it's, and that's your body using energy to break down the food. That's exactly what it is. When you have something that's clean and pure and organic, and you put it into your body, it takes no time at all. So you think your body, to eat a piece of a cow, because that's really what a steak is, is a piece of a cow. When you eat a piece of a cow, depending on the cut of the animal's body, it, it'll take anywhere from two to five days to go through you. It basically rots through your organs until it comes out your bum. A chicken will take, again, depending on the cut of the animal, a chicken's body will take anywhere from one to three days. You know, fish is a day. So you're always keeping your body going. You have so much energy and you sleep less. Now, when I'm on my sort of vibe and I'm, I'm not flying halfway across the world to, <laughs> to, to Maui, you know, I'll sleep five hours and I feel amazing. And you wake up in the morning and, you know, you go to bed by 10, 11, 12, whatever. You get up at five in the morning, you go to the gym, you work out, come back, shower, have your green smoothie, your chocolate smoothie, and you start your day. And you just, you're a happier person. You know, one of the things I've discovered in the last couple of years is, I mean, people love the food I do back home, for sure. I've had lots of recognition, magazines and TV and, you know, but the biggest benefit is, I mean, we're all in life, we all need to make a living and people always want to do business with people who are happy, you know, and if you're putting good food into your body, you're always happy, you're always feeling good, you're not, you're not usually a negative person. I mean, we're all negative at times, but, you know, what I've learned, and especially in the last several years, is food has a direct influence on the human being that you are. I attribute so much of how I changed to Kale. <laughs> I'm not going to lie. Kale is my friend. I'm very active on Facebook and Twitter, and I'm always talking about Kale. Kale is one of the most beautiful things you can put into your body. Really high in calcium, antioxidants, iron. It's just, it's a superfood. It gives you life and energy. So, yeah, I mean, it, it's, been a, it's been a really cool seven years for me. I'm going to be a published author in a year. I'm writing a raw food book right now. Um, it's going to be available in Canada, United States, Australia, and the UK. Magazine, before I came here, again, magazine articles, TV, like four times last the week before last. I give talks like this. I give motiv motivational speaking now to people who want to change their lives. I do lots of cooking demonstrations, talks. I teach when I have time. And there's always something wanting to do business with me, you know, which is a great feeling. I went from making, you know, 55 down to 19, up to 25. I'm back up to 55 right now, but then there's people who want to do business with me, and I'm writing a book. You know, passion is a great thing. People see passion, recognize passion, and I, I really need to attribute it all to a plant-based diet. It really changed my life in, in, in so many ways. I'm going to do a raw beet ravioli. So I'm going to show you how to marinate beets into, like, the pasta shell. I'm going to do a cat dill cashew red pepper ricotta cheese. So I'll show you how to manipulate the fat from cashews and turn it into a cheese. And then I'm making a really quick blender sauce. It's going to be a red pepper tomato basil marinara sauce. This is pretty much the trademark dish that I've come up with in my raw food cooking. Featured in the Toronto Star because of this dish. This dish actually also helped me get my book deal. The, uh, the, the publisher was reading the, magazine, uh, the newspaper on a Sunday morning and he saw it. and He said, yeah, we had too much of negotiations and that's how I got the book. Again, questions at the end. We're going out for dinner after. If any of you guys want to come out and have some lentils with me and talk about life, that would be really cool. It'll be like four in the morning for me, but whatever. I'm young. I eat kale, right? <laughs> so that's my spiel. Again, if any of you are considering going vegetarian, vegan, raw, whatever you want to call it, don't hesitate. Don't hesitate. May do a little bit of research, you know. Instead of going home and drinking some wine, go on the computer, buy some books, go on Amazon, order your books, and just do a little bit of research. You'll see that this diet really can change your life. You're saving tons of animals. Like, they're just absolutely abused. Animals have feelings. They, they love. They just want to live. And for us to treat them like a commodity is just disrespectful and disgusting to me. And then the environment. We're destroying this world right now for animal agriculture. We're tearing down forests. We're, we're doing so much damage. I could speak on the, the environmental aspects of animal agriculture probably for a week. You know, I'll leave that up to you to do some research on the internet. But just, you know, even the United Nations came out with a topic about how it is the number one threat of greenhouse gases and it's changing our atmosphere and it's changing our world. Any more than cars, more than factories, more than anything else. It's us raising animals to eat them, and in turn we get diabetes, cancer, and so many diseases. Thank you for listening to me. I'm going to go over there. I'm going to show you how to make some raw food. Save your questions to the end. Before they cut me off, I'm going to take one picture for Twitter. Can I get an aloha?
Thank you. <laughs> oh, hello. See, I always wanted to be a singer, but I'm, I'm really terrible. Terrible, terrible, terrible. Okay, guys, so I'm going to get going here. This first method is, it's, I, it's just basically marinating, and I'll explain a little bit more. Um, I have a red beet here. I'm going to take both ends off of the beet. I always save all my scraps for compost. I always like to give back to the earth what I'm sort of using as opposed to just taking. This is a variation on a dish several raw food chefs have done over the years. I kind of, I kind of improved on it a little bit. See, the idea with raw food is, again, you want everything to be on process. So when you think of a traditional ravioli, it's generally made with wheat flour, which is gluten. Gluten is actually very hard for the body to digest. It's pretty much like a glue. So you think about eating gluten and it goes in through your mouth and it goes down and it sort of sticks on to the different parts of your body as you're absorbing it. The more you can avoid gluten out of your diet, you will definitely start to breathe better. You will start to feel a little bit lighter. If you do cardiovascular exercise at all, you will see a difference in your stamina levels. So basically a raw food diet is 100% gluten free just by nature. Sometimes there are people that use kamut, which is a grain, they'll sprout it. There is a little bit of gluten found in kamut. So this is a Japanese mandolin. In most kitchen supply stores, in most areas, you can find it for fairly cheap. It's usually about 15 or 20 bucks. We found it today for 65. It's usually not that expensive. I don't know why that store was, but it's a pretty simple thing. I use it a lot in raw food. All it does is allow you to slice every single piece of vegetable at the exact same thickness or width. So all I'm going to do is take my beet and I'm going to slice it, uh, I'm going to slice it here fairly thin. I want it to be almost paper thin. It really is that simple. So that's going to be the actual paper for my ravioli. All I'm going to do is get these into a bowl and I'm going to add a few things here. This is almost scientific in a way, what I'm doing. A raw food diet is typically higher in calories. But you want to understand something that when you're eating nothing but whole, unprocessed, organic foods, you're able to eat anywhere from 30 to 40% more calories without having to worry about weight gain. The main reason is all of your organs are working properly. So your liver is metabolizing everything, your gallbladder is doing its thing, your lungs, your kidneys. Everything you put into your body on a whole food, raw, uh, raw food diet is very good for you. It's very nutritious. So I always say, imagine eating a diet where everything is good. So I'm just going to get a little bit of oil here. I'm using olive oil, but you could use any form of oil. It could be avocado oil, it could be hemp oil, flax oil, anything at all. The reason I'm getting oil on here is it's going to act as a carrier for the other two things I'm putting on. A little bit of organic sea salt. So what the salt is going to do is it's going to help draw out the moisture in the actual beet. It's almost like curing the beet in a way. Going to get a little bit of lemon juice on here. What the lemon juice is going to do is going to actually act as, uh, it's, it's, it's an acid. So the acid, is, again, is going to help break down this beet. I'm going to let this sit for about 10 or 15 minutes. And again, what's going to happen is the salt is going to draw out the moisture and the acid is going to break down the cell walls. So you're going to have, in essence, in a 10 or 15 minutes or so, you're going to have something that's very soft and has the mouthfeel of pasta. So I'm just going to let that hang out and do its thing. I'm going to move on to cashew ricotta cheese. Now this, this method of making uh, a raw cheese or a raw pate is the same with any sort of raw dip, pate, cheese, anything at all. So again, pay attention to what I'm doing. I'm going to explain as I go and I'll, I'll give you another variation of what you could do. You could do a mock tuna salad with sunflower seeds. What I'm using is cashews. When I'm making a recipe, um, before I move on, actually, I'll explain. In a raw food kitchen, you want a few pieces of equipment. You want a decent food processor. You want at least a 10-cup food processor. Reason is, you're always... I, I like to relate it to the fact that when you buy an iPod and you don't... It, it runs out of space really quickly, you just want to get a bigger iPod or an iPhone. Same with the blender. You're going to find you're using it a lot more, the food processor, and you're just going to want to buy the big one right at the beginning. So go with at least a 10... If you can find a used one, I really recommend it. They're on Craigslist sometimes for about 200 bucks. New, a really high power blender is going to run you four or $500. It is expensive, but it's really worth the investment and you're going to have it for the rest of your life. The last thing I'll say is, is this. Every kitchen, every, every, every kitchen, no matter whether it's raw food diet, vegan diet, 
fruitarian, you need a, a French knife or a chef's knife, which is this. You always want to have a really good one. Don't be cheap and buy a crappy one. And you want to have a paring knife. These are the two most important things in any kitchen. You can do almost any task with these two things. Once you have these three things, it's, it's, it's easy from there. There's dehydrators, but those are for as you get more advanced and you start eating more that way. Because you don't want to spend three or four hundred dollars right away on a dehydrator and realize, oh, I'm never going to use it. And it sits in your cupboard. And then you're going to hate the raw food diet and you're going to hate me. And I'm never going to come back here and talk again. <laughs> and I don't want that to happen because it's paradise. So I'm going to move on really quickly to, uh, this is the cashew ricotta cheese. So I think of the food processor when I'm doing a recipe like this as my saute pan. So when you start a saute pan, you get oil in it, and then you get your seasonings, whether it's chili flakes or garlic or anything. You start sauteing. Same idea with the food processor. What I'm going to do is, in here, I'm going to get uh, red pepper. I'll show you guys really quickly how to clean a red pepper so there's never any waste. Take a little bit off the top and a little bit off the bottom. And what you want to do is you want to look through the actual pepper so I can see the people in the audience. You're going to take your knife, and I'm going to do this up this way. I mean, normally I would do this. All you're going to do is you're going to take your knife and you're going to run it through one side, okay? You're going to open it up, lay it flat. You take your knife and you run it along the inside. That way you never have any waste. And what you're left with is a perfect red pepper fillet. All of this is just going to go into the compost. In a kitchen, chefs, we never waste anything. It's so hard to make a living in a restaurant. That's why you see so many restaurants go out of business because they don't know what they're doing and they don't do things like that. I'll see chefs that open a pepper, they'll take a pepper, they'll cut it down the middle and they'll take this and they'll rip this all out. That's money right there. That's 30, 40 cents. You hire a young cook to do that for you, he might do 50 peppers a day. You know, it adds up. Oh, what is that, $1.50 or $15 a day and just losing that little bit. So never, 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 never. Actually, ha, I did it myself. <laughs> You know, and I went through this also when I was a young chef doing things. I had chefs yelling at me and telling me what to do and how to do it. And it's, it's tough love for sure. It's a very cutthroat industry, but that's, in my opinion, it's the best way to learn. There's no real fancy way of cutting in raw food unless you're garnishing because everything is just going to get blended anyway. I want to cut it a little bit smaller to give the machine a little bit less work to do. You're always preserving your motors that way because that's why you're paying all this money is for these nice, these big fancy motors. I'm going to get a little bit of nutritional yeast. Nutritional yeast is an inactive yeast. It grows on molasses. They purposely grow it on molasses and uh, for the purpose of B12. B12 is something, um, really, it's the only thing on a vegan diet that you should be wary of. The way we normally get it is through eating animals. We get it from another source. It's a really cool ingredient. And whether you're doing raw food or cooked food, there's many applications for it. It's great on popcorn. If you're making a big pot of soup, uh, you turn the heat off at the end, you throw in a handful of this, it just richens it teaspoon I think has 200% of your day's requirement so there's a lot of people who are really worried about B12 and it's one of those things on the internet and they say this is the simplest way if you're eating popcorn if you're eating a sandwich you just sprinkle a little bit on your your vegan mayonnaise before you eat your sandwich it's very simple so since I'm doing a raw cheese I'm getting a little bit of nutritional yeast in here lemon juice lemon juice is something I use a lot of in raw food Lemon juice adds no calories whatsoever and it really helps to brighten the background flavor. So when you're eating food, the cool thing about raw food, vegan food in general, is we're not relying on dairy and cheese and butter and deep frying usually and cream. So we rely on acids and vinegars and seasonings and spices. It's great on the tongue. I like to refer to this food as sexy food. You really see food for what it is when it's broken down in its rawest form as opposed to, you know, breading something and putting a stick of butter underneath that. It, that's not food. It's just empty, terrible calories that's making human beings sick. Something like this is wonderful. The lemon juice helps on the back of the tongue and it brightens the flavors. I don't know, I had dry dill at the restaurant when I wrote this recipe. I think red pepper and dill is a great combination. If you are going to put salt into your diet, you want it to be the highest quality salt possible. Okay, so I have my red pepper, lemon juice, nutritional yeast. Uh, I'm going to throw some garlic in here. Garlic, another little tip is you want to remove that butt end here. It's hard to digest. You just give it a tap with the knife and you should be able to peel the skin right off just like that. It's very simple. Don't hit it too hard at the beginning. Okay, again, take that butt end off. A lot of people have problems digesting garlic. Now this isn't the, the end all to uh, fixing it, but I can give one tip here is you cut the, you ever have garlic where you see the green ends growing on it? It's really old. That actual sprout, essentially, that's growing in the inside is going to give you really bad digestion. So what you can do is you can peel the garlic open. It just means the garlic's old. It's still growing. 
you want to take that green part out with your paring knife and that's going to help with digestion. You ever get that garlic burp after too when you eat lots of garlic? That's what you're doing is you're eating this little green thing. So you just want to take that out, get rid of it. It's bad food. Again, you don't have to worry about the garlic being perfect, perfect, you know, any kind of a shape because you're just pureeing it down. You want to be careful with using raw garlic in raw food cuisine because you're not cooking it. You're getting a huge hit of flavor. So I actually prefer not to put a lot at the beginning and then if it needs more at the end. It's actually a general rule of thumb. You can always add. You can never take away in, in food, in cooking, in raw food, in anything. So I added my, I'm adding my cashews in here now. <laughs> so again, all I'm doing is breaking down uh, the cashews here with my seasoning. Another good point is you always want to soak your nuts or seeds ahead of time. Reason being, they're in something called their dormant state and you always want to use raw. When you roast a nut or a seed, you denature the fatty acid chains and you turn them, they become acidic. They, you lose almost all the vitamins, minerals and nutrients. They taste great. I think we've all probably at one time in our lives sat down eating a whole bag of roasted salted cashews. They taste delicious. But they're so bad for you. Just not good food. So I soak this ahead of time. What it's going to do is it's going to bring out the enzymes in the food, make it much easier to digest. Sometimes on a raw food diet, it's been criticized for having a lot of nuts and seeds. Again, one, one way around that is by soaking it ahead of time. It becomes more of a living food. And all, since all those enzymes are out, it's much easier to digest. You'll never have an issue with that. It also makes it easier for me to manipulate it at this point. I may add a little bit of water while the food processor is going. That's just going to give me a fluffier consistency. I had soaked these ahead of time um, and then gotten rid of the water. But uh, since then, they've dried up a little bit. So I may add a little bit of water as I'm going. So that's pretty much it. I'm going to obviously, I'm going to taste it for seasoning. As chefs, we always taste things on our hands. At least good chefs always taste things here. You never want to be tasting your fingers in a kitchen. I've been slapped upside the head so many times by chefs that say, don't lick your fingers, it's disgusting. So we always put food here, whether it's a sauce or anything. Tomatoes, since it is a tomato marinara sauce. Again, you don't have to worry too much. One mistake that a lot of home cooks and even chefs make is they'll take the tomato and there's a core in here that you don't want to eat. Again, hard to digest. It's just not good food. The real way to do it is you take a paring knife or you can buy these little tools that scoop it and you just want to twist the tomato around. I've done this so many times, I really don't need to look anymore. And all you do is you take the core out and you don't waste anything. Most chefs or cooks at home, you'll see them and they'll do this. And they'll take the top of the tomato off and they'll throw that out. But it's absolutely ridiculous. Again, you're throwing money away, you're throwing food away. There's still a core in here. And if they see a core, they may even cut deeper. Oh, absolutely terrible. It's a definite no, 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 no. Okay, so again, you just want to take your core out. You know, nothing that I've done here is very, is very difficult either tonight. I mean, am I right? There's, it takes no time at all. People get really, they're really daunted by raw food because they think it's a lot of work. There are definite recipes out there that <laughs> they take two days, but generally what I like to do is food, you break it down and you, it, it, it takes no time whatsoever. The dehydrated stuff, um, it takes a little bit of time, but again, that's as you get more advanced. So again, you don't need to worry too much about what it looks like. I want to stop and say really quickly, I went to, uh, when I was in Maui earlier this week, I went to the Leilani uh, Farm Animal Sanctuary. Such a nice little spot in, uh, in paradise. Uh, the name of the woman that runs it was Lori, uh, Lori, Lori Lee Blanchard. It was really nice to be there. She has uh, a rescued deer. She's so sweet, so cute. Her mother was killed by hunters and she was left at the side of the road just to die. So they took her on. There's a little pot-bellied pig that runs around. There's chickens, there's some goats, there's uh, ducks, uh, roosters. It's really nice if you ever get a chance to visit a sanctuary like that. And there are several. There's one in California. There's many all over the place. You actually get to spend time with these animals and see that they have feelings. They all have personalities. There's definitely some chickens that are more aggressive than others and those are the kind of the cocky guys. And they walk around because all the women are following them and you see the goats and some, some are timid and shy and again, some are just cocky and arrogant. When you start to spend time with animals like that, you start to see really some of the only differences, they don't speak English. They speak their own language, but they don't speak English. 
I have a tattoo on my shoulder and it says, uh, it's a cow, and it says, how about I eat you? I'll show you guys after. The whole purpose of the tattoo, I know, I know, I did it when I was in my protesting phase, but I love it. The whole purpose of the tattoo is, you know, what would an, a cow say if, if, if it could speak English? And it would say, you know, how would I eat you? Why, what are you doing, why are you doing this to me? Like, again, animals, they just want to live, they want to love, they want to have sex, they want to roll around in the pastures and, and live their life. And f for some reason, I think, well, mostly a monetary reason, we started eating them. And we're getting really sick. <laughs> uh, dry basil, a little bit of nutritional yeast again, and this just helps in the richness. I'm not adding a lot here, because I don't want it to have a cheesy texture. But again, nutrition, you're getting your B12 in here, and it adds a richness, a uh, background richness. Sun-dried tomatoes are a really great ingredient in raw food. I soak them up ahead of time. You can generally buy them in oil or dried. I buy them dried, so I can add my own oil sources. They really help to thicken the sauce, because if I was just to blend this now, it would be really watery. So this is what's going to help bind it and bring it all together. And then I always like to use a little bit of the soaking water from the sun-dried tomatoes. That way, if I am watching my salt intake, the water is still salty and I don't have to add any extra salt. And lastly, this is a fairly large recipe. Uh, so there's a good amount of oil in it, but you want to understand that this will feed, you know, 10 people or you can keep it in your fridge for four or five days and you can just pick at it. Again, raw food diets are really about healthy fats. Um, everyone is scared of the word fat because they relate that to a big fat belly or a fat bum or love handles where it couldn't be more untrue. Healthy fats actually act as energy in the body. They're not stored. Yeah, I mean, things like avocado, hemp oil, flax oil, olive oil, all these things in their raw, unprocessed unpro form, they act as energy. They're great for your skin. They're great for your mood, especially EFAs, like from hemp seeds or hemp oil. They're just great for boosting your mood. If you're ever down, snack on some hemp seeds. They make you feel great almost right away. So there is a cup of oil in here. You could use anything. Um, I'm just using olive oil because it's what I had available to me. But you could definitely mix uh, half macadamia oil, half avocado oil, olive oil, flax oil, hemp oil, flax oil, anything at all. Um, so again, you're getting all of this beautiful vitamin C. You're getting fatty acids, your garlic, your nutritional yeast for B12. So I'm going to get this into my high-powered blender. And as you can see, this, this wouldn't break down too well in a regular blender. You would still have seeds left from the tomatoes. So it's one of the benefits to buying one. I got mine off Craigslist for 150 bucks. I was lucky enough to do it. If you contact, I don't know about here in Toronto, I have raw food companies. A lot of the times they have ones that people have returned. You can get them for really cheap. You always want to start a blender on low and work up to high. That's why you see people, it blows up at the top. You always want to start low and go to high. That really is pretty much it. You probably see recipes on the internet if you've ever looked into raw food about how we use zucchini pasta, we use zucchini noodles. I couldn't, sh I couldn't get one in my luggage to bring over here. I really wanted to do that. If you get a chance, go on YouTube and just see people making zucchini noodles in a machine called a spiralizer. Uh, it's really cool. It's really funky. Um, it's a great way. It actually has a mouthfeel of pasta, but this recipe that I've given you is a perfect example of how you can toss your zucchini pasta with a sauce and it actually tastes like real pasta. And again, you're getting no gluten. You're getting all the benefits of that, that raw food. I'm going to take my sauce. I'm going to taste it. I always taste everything I make. Tastes delicious. Come on. I, I'm not going to come from Toronto and make bad food, right? Okay, so my raviolis have had some time to marinate and break down. They've all done their job. As you can see, they've actually become a lot more shiny and a lot more pliable. Some of the liquid has actually come out of it. And again, that's that salt and that lemon juice going to work. So it's really pretty simple from here. All I'm going to do is lay out my uh, ravioli wrappers on the cutting board. I'm going to take my cheese filling, my ricotta cheese, and put about a tablespoon in each. 
Um, sometimes you have really big beets, you can just put more filling. It's really nice. The rutabagas or turnips are really nice because they're about that big. So it looks really cool when you're serving it to pesto sauce on top. So it looks really cool when you're serving it to someone. You could do a green pesto sauce on top as opposed to my basil marinara sauce. Again, this is sexy food. Like this is what I mean by sexy food. You know, that's a beautiful color. That's what food should look like. You imagine this is so detoxifying for your blood and your body when it goes in and you're digesting it. It does amazing things. All I'm going to do here is take my ravioli uh, top. I want to talk really quickly before I'm finished here, before I start plating. Organic food is really important. Now, for me, when I first got into this, I did it for ethics, the environment, and for health. And I, at first, I was like, organic, you know, whatever. It's a marketing ploy. It's a lot more money. <clears throat> from what I've come to learn and understand over the last several years is it's absolutely important that we buy nothing but organic food. <clears throat> you think back 40 years ago, everything was organic. The word organic didn't exist because everything was just organic. Basically, what happened has happened in the last... 10 years or so, maybe 15 years, large corporations have gotten a hold of our food supply. So most of our spinach, most of our, our greens, our, uh, our even pineapples are maybe not here because you have Dole, but all over the world it's, it's controlled by Coca-Cola and Pepsi and Frito-Lay. They're just large corporations that got a hold of it and said, okay, well, we can make a lot more money doing this. So let's do it. Let's add growth hormones. Let's add, add, add all sorts of fungicides and herbicides because they'll yield a bigger crop in a shorter amount of time. So what's happening is we're getting really sick. I think everyone here has knows someone that's been affected by diabetes or by cancer or by osteoporosis. We're just not getting enough minerals and nutrients into our body. Organic food is very expensive. But again, we all have something in our lives that we can give up. Most of us will drink lots of coffee or we'll go for that really expensive bottle of wine or we'll want to go out. It's really important to spend that money on that food that those farmers are, com are growing. Again, that's where our food used to come from, and it's not anymore. It's coming from multinational corporations. It's a really scary thing. Food Inc. is a really great movie. It's an example of where our food is coming from. Monsanto is a large corporation. They've basically taken a hold of every seed known to man, and they're just multiplying and multiplying, and, and they're, destroying, they're destroying our health. They don't care. It's just nothing but profit. So when we support local farmers, yeah, you're paying maybe $2 more for organic kale as opposed to conventional, but you're, really, you're, you're using your money to, to help the future. Because if we keep buying organic food, the prices will eventually go down. People will say, oh, there's a, de there's a demand. More, more people, more farmers will start growing it. It will become more available. You know, 20 years from now, I hope conventional food doesn't exist. You know, it's people like, like all of us, you're listening to me, hopefully you go home and you go to the store and you have that choice of spending $2 or 350 Hopefully you make that 350 choice. Um, or you do the best you can, you know? Okay, so let me, I'm gonna show you really quickly on how I like to plate. I really think it's important to make food look good. So I'm gonna show you a couple things here. Um, I did a kale salad up ahead of time. I'm going to use my apron here. I know it's a faux pas, but I don't have any rags. And I want this to look good for the camera. I made a kale salad up ahead of time today for you. I didn't have time to demo that as well. So basically, it's black, local black kale. It's absolutely gorgeous. Uh, tossed with Swiss chard, shredded beets, red pepper, sun-dried tomatoes. And I made a dressing similar to this one. It's a blended cashew, red pepper. There's actually lots of macadamia nut oil in there because uh, it's local and it, it tastes amazing and it's really good for you. So it's totally raw. And again, it's the same technique that I showed you before using the acid and the salt and the oil. So I just use the sea salt, I use lemon juice and the macadamia nut oil. I let it marinate for about half an hour, it breaks down, it's really soft. Uh, salads like this, you know, are easy to make every day. There's so many variations on doing them. So I always like to work with height when I plate. So that's one way, that's the kale salad that you're about to eat. Take my ravioli. I could actually crimp the ravioli a little bit here. It's beet on the bottom? It's uh, beet, uh, both are beet. It's all beet, there's, there's, yeah, just beet. Can you get the beet to crimp? Absolutely. So I'm gonna have that like that. I'm gonna show you a couple different ways to plate. 
The other one, this is a technique we, uh, professional chefs use. We'll take the plate, we'll take a dollop of sauce. So as you can see there, this is actually a cheater, like I'll charge four dollars more a plate just by doing this. <laughs> but, I mean, it doesn't it look already, it looks like you're in a professional restaurant. There's so many more things you can do. You could take another smaller dot here and just come across, so that looks sexy as well. Um, I always garnish, I always garnish with the same, the same herb or spice that I use in the beginning, so I might take a little bit of fresh basil. Right, and just go right across the plate. And I'll take my ravioli. You always want to do odd numbers when you're plating as well. Um, it just looks better. One, three, or five as opposed to two or four. I'm going to take more of the sauce. A canal is just a fancy French uh, term for a three-sided football shape. If you ever go to a fancy restaurant and you get sorbet or anything like that, this is always the shape you're going to get. Yeah, that's good for that one. So I'm going to take my sauce and I'll just lightly ladle the sauce over here. For this one, I'm just going to let the sauce fall naturally. Whoops. You don't know how many waiters and waitresses I have tormented over the years. <laughs> they don't like, I actually had one quit on me one time, I made them cry. I mean, I'm a nice guy, but when I put all that work into something, I want it to look good. Especially for something like that in a restaurant, I would charge $14. It's a lot of work, a lot of labor, and it's all organic. I like garnishing with sprouts. I think they're beautiful. It's very simple. And yeah, I mean, that's very simple. I mean, that's a great way, an example of how you can get more raw food. Other things will be dates, almonds, and agave, and you'll have a date almond ball. Um, and then you can get into superfoods and there's a whole other world of healthy, healthy things and f then you'll just be flying and you're going to want to tell everyone to stop eating bread. And Thank you very much. I really appreciate your time. You know, and again, just one last time, thank you to the Vegetarian Society of Hawaii. Thank you to Ori. Thank you to everyone. And if you're ever in Toronto, come visit me. I know it's pretty far. <laughs> Thank you, Doug, for coming to Hawaii, for sharing your journey as a vegan chef, and for giving us such an exciting raw food demo. You have created a visual and sensual feast for all of us in the audience. I'd also like to thank Down to Earth again for providing the ingredients Doug was using tonight. Mahalo to all of you for coming, and have a safe return home. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> This program is brought to you by the Vegetarian Society of Hawaii, a nonprofit organization dedicated to sharing with the community the many benefits of a vegetarian diet. Free monthly meetings include vegetarian experts found locally and on the mainland, quick and easy cooking demonstrations, and helpful and delicious food samples. Members enjoy an informative quarterly newsletter, social activities, and discounts at many vegetarian-friendly restaurants and health food stores. For an application, call 944-8344. That's 944-8344. Or visit our website at www.vsh.org. vsh.org.